are back with another English presentation. This one comes to us pre-recorded uh, from the uh, CUT UA, the Communication Analysis Team for Ukraine. And the title of this presentation, as you can see already, is War Communication in Ukrainian Social Media Space. And uh, I hope that everything will work smoothly. I'm still uh, downloading the file as uh, it is being played, but uh, I will start the video file now. Hello, dear friends. I'm going to tell you about our voluntary initiative about social media analysis. Uh, we call ourselves CAT UA, Communication Analysis Team Ukraine. Uh, we started as a volunteering group uh, from February uh, 24. It was uh, the first day of the war. So uh, we, um, as uh, uh, media analysis, uh, guys tried to help our uh, militaries and all who need this uh, to um, to feel better in uh, communications and uh, in um, information war so we started this uh, analysis and um, uh, on daily basis we provide it uh, to them and um, uh, <clears throat> i will show a bit about um, the first results you can see that uh, these results were february 24 april 4 so these are uh, data that uh, it is safe to show to people uh, and i can share it to you because uh, now uh, more recent data is uh, much more sensitive uh, it uh, it's impossible to share it but uh, this presentation uh, will show how do we work and uh, what uh, we usually do and uh, maybe how you can help us so uh, let's see let's start uh, with uh, the short uh, you know, like explanation how uh, both sides of the war participate uh, in information war uh, how uh, these both machines work let's start with a russian machine it is very traditional uh, you maybe know that uh, it uh, uh, was started with uh, so-called uh, historic, uh, actually pseudo-historic speech of Putin. He told that uh, Ukraine never existed and uh, a lot of other conspiracy theories. Uh, it was um, published uh, at night, his speech, and uh, then he started... Uh, uh, he launched the war and uh, we Ukrainians hear the explosions and so on. Uh, other people who helped Putin to create um, strategic narrative, let's call this so, uh, are uh, his uh, court jesters. Uh, maybe you know some of these people, Medvedev, Dugin, uh, Margarita Simulian, a lot of people who uh, can... Uh, tell something much more uh, radical than Putin can, but uh, usually nobody considers them seriously. And at last, all propaganda machine uh, of uh, Russian state is Russian TV, you know, uh, Russia uh, First Channel and uh, Russia Today and other channels. The second is uh, RIA Novosti and other uh, web uh, news websites. And at last, uh, so-called uh, troll factory in Olgino, uh, these uh, guys who uh, leave a lot of posts, comments, and so on, and uh, also promote uh, state uh, outlook. Uh, so they um, uh, work in highly centralized machine, and uh, uh, all this structure leads by one guy, you know it uh, on the first number, uh, and uh, this is uh, their power and their weakness and how Ukrainian machine works. And um, uh, as you see from the uh, headline, it's a, it is highly decentralized. And um, uh, I have to make uh, some um, explanation about uh, what is uh, so-called affective public. It is the definition of Zizi Papacherisi, uh, this uh, scholar, uh, provided it uh, when studied uh, revolution, uh, uh, so-called Arab Spring, but uh, applied it also to another 
uh, events, uh, it is, uh, it, uh, uh, this is the state of uh, public that appears during large-scale social uh, movements like Arab Spring, Revolution of Dignity, Occupy Wall Street, or even Me Too, uh, so it can be completely online movement, but uh, people also uh, can be engaged in something in this state called affective public. Uh, this state provides its own connective gatekeeping. Uh, what uh, maybe you know, what does it mean gatekeeping? So it uh, selects uh, news that are valuable. Usually media select news, but here uh, a web community selects news when it is uh, engaged in some, in some process. So uh, it provides connective gatekeeping, it provides connective framing. It's also a very interesting thing because uh, a lot of facts may be framed by some another uh, circumstances. Uh, so uh, usually media provide framing for facts, but uh, in the state of effective public, uh, just people provide uh, framing for the uh, events and also that's interesting that they provide connective storytelling when uh, same people became both actors and narrators of the story of movement uh, so they first act as an actors and then became uh, tellers who uh, provide uh, the narrative about this story so uh, this is how uh, social media environment now works in Ukraine. There is nothing similar in Russia because uh, they are uh, all environment highly centralized. But here people decide by themselves what they uh, have to uh, discuss, what they have to uh, analyze and so on. And uh, as we show before, uh, not before, but then I will show it. Uh, neither Ukrainian nor Russian authority had crucial impact on the Ukrainian strategic narrative. Well, let's move to our research. Uh, we uh, took daily uh, the set of uh, web posts from commercial monitoring system USCAN. Uh, these are posts uh, from Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Telegram, Vkontakte, and TikTok. They are searched for the words typical in describing the military action, so it's automatical program that selects such posts. Uh, and these are posts uh, uh, that have uh, geolocation Ukraine or not defined, uh, so we don't want to uh, lose these uh, posts who didn't set their geolocation. Uh, and uh, also we select uh, about 3% of daily amount of posts and uh, that is um, amount that we can process manually. It's 100 and, uh, one, excuse me, 1050 posts uh, from uh, all data set. Coding, manual coding, uh, I will um, tell a bit more about why it is manual. Uh, in the end, but uh, only manual coding that we apply. Uh, first of all, we select a post from Ukraine uh, from the not defined uh, geolocation posts. So our analysts uh, look on not only the on the content of the posts, but also on the profiles of people and uh, determine whether they are from Ukraine. Uh, then side of the conflict, uh, we uh, determine whether uh, this outlook is pro-Russian or pro-Ukrainian. Some uh, scholars asked me, uh, didn't you see uh, posts uh, that are not pro-Russian, not pro-Ukrainian, something in the middle? And uh, I always answer that it's impossible because when you see shelling bombs uh, on your uh, house, it's impossible to remain neutral in this situation. Uh, then uh, for pro-Ukrainian posts, we also put 
mood of the post is um, uh, the topic uh, belongs to good news, uh, ambiguous news, or bad news. Uh, it is determined, uh, determined based on the uh, whether the facts reported in the letter are positive from the Ukrainian perspective of the war or not. Uh, then, uh, whether the post contains link to the official source, uh, we determine emotions also manually and a message of communication that is the most interesting. It's my own uh, approach um, uh, developed for uh, commercial uh, media analysis for uh, uh, detection of uh, and evaluation of the success in, uh, for example, information campaigns for different uh, brands. But uh, here uh, it was applied to uh, propaganda detection. Messages of communication are evaluated for both sides of the conflicts. Uh, so additional system automatically indicates gender uh, and uh, region of residence, and uh, we can use this uh, also for our analysis. What do we have? From the beginning of the war, uh, the share of pro-Russian attitude is very, very small. Uh, in all Ukrainian information space, uh, we have only about 9% uh, of uh, posts uh, with uh, pro-Russian attitude. The most interesting that uh, this 99% of pro-Ukrainian attitude are very different posts. These are posts from media, posts from authorities of different level, and most of all posts from um, ordinary people who, um, who are engaged in this uh, situation, who uh, want to be uh, to participate in war as volunteers, as uh, uh, militaries, as uh, uh, other people who just pay uh, uh, for. Uh, who just support the economy of Ukraine and so on. Uh, so um, this, are, um, this is really um, like a people's movement. But this 9%, uh, it was uh, just opposite. Most of these posts are official posts, as we can expect uh, from highly centralized uh, machine. So usually these are people who um, maybe share uh, posts from official sources or uh, just uh, uh, these posts from them. And also these are posts from uh, known pro-Russian bloggers that live usually on uh, occupied, uh, many time ago occupied territories like Donetsk, Lugansk region or uh, Crimea. So. Uh, it's almost nothing from uh, other parts uh, of uh, Ukraine, only on the territories who are who were occupied uh, eight years ago. Um, there are some posts uh, with pro-Russian attitude. Uh, let's mm, uh, focus on messages, uh, motivating messages uh, of pro-Ukrainian uh, pro users, users usually focus on motivating messages about uh, military achievements. Uh, that was the most interesting uh, circumstance that allowed uh, Ukrainians uh, to, um, to keep their, they, themselves motivated for the war, because uh, uh, they saw that it's possible to repulse Russian troops from Ukraine. So that was the main message uh, from the first months. Also, uh, other messages uh, like uh, uh, Russia is attacking civilians or uh, at the end of, the, uh, of this period when uh, Northern Ukraine was uh, liberated. A lot of uh, eyewitnesses about uh, war crimes appeared in Bucha, maybe you know this word, uh, this name of the city, Bucha, uh, Hostomel, uh, different villages of northern Ukraine. Uh, all these uh, uh, stories appeared in uh, the information space and also uh, it was very interesting that these stories uh, didn't uh, provide uh, sadness. And we will see it uh, on the plot about emotions. These stories provided uh, only 
anger. So people became angry, more and more angry. Uh, the same what we have about pro-Russian attitude and uh, propaganda focused on the uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. It was not uh, about all Ukraine. They usually spoke about uh, these two regions who were uh, occupied uh, eight years ago, and they still uh, told that Ukrainian soldiers um, by uh, their version uh, are shelling Donetsk and Lugansk still that for eight years. Uh, I will not uh, just focus on this issue because it's not true, uh, but um, they uh, didn't found uh, nothing more actual to uh, communicate with Ukrainians. Uh, they just repeat and repeat the same message. Uh, the second place is here yeah, that Russia takes control of cities and strategic objects and uh, so on. Uh, dehumanizing of Ukrainian people that uh, Ukrainians are Nazis and extremists and so on and so on. Uh, uh, they are trying to uh, persuade, but um, they had no success in it. Uh, let's look on mood and sources of pro-Ukrainian citizen. Uh, we saw that despite a lot of tragedies, despite of all lost territories, um, the largest share uh, of uh, pro-Ukrainian posts uh, was about good news. A lot of people focused not on losses, but on uh, maybe small victories, sometimes big victories, uh, but on uh, things that uh, show uh, that uh, we are... Um, we can really uh, win this war. Uh, also, uh, just look on the share of uh, official sources. It is about 18% uh, for the first months. Uh, so you can see that uh, most of the discussion uh, is kept uh, on the uh, side of uh, uh, pro, uh, that is not controlled by the state. Uh, so, as I told, it's a really, um, really people's war. Uh, let's look on the dynamics. Uh, we saw uh, very interesting dynamics that, yeah, uh, till the end, uh -huh, it's not full uh, plot, but uh, it's, uh, all, it was almost the same uh, till the uh, April 4th. Uh, so we can see that there are a lot of um, spikes of optimism or uh, pessimism, but uh, till the beginning of the April, it was slow pessimism strengthening. Uh, and uh, um, after that time, it was uh, the dynamics changed. But uh, maybe you see um, that Sometimes there were uh, uh, huge spikes of uh, optimism. Uh, it was, uh, uh, it, it were uh, different uh, events like uh, destruction of uh, Russian aircraft or ships and some peaks of bad news were caused by Russian crimes against a civilian population and so on. Uh, let's look to the next slide. And here we see that Uh, news from official sources have very different uh, share of good, bad news and ambiguous news uh, comparing to informal sources. Uh, official sources during the first uh, period of the war were much more optimistic. 55% of official communication was uh, dedicated to the good news, but people didn't rely on this. People, as I said, created their uh, own uh, storytelling. Uh, they didn't uh, just um, tell or retell the news. They changed this news, changed this story. 
they participate in it, so they um, have uh, just a very, um, very different share. Uh, we see that a lot of uh, uh, ambiguous views, for example, these are posts about volunteering activity. It's not good news, it's not bad news, it's just uh, calls to uh, participate in the volunteering movement, to uh, join uh, different uh, activities that uh, support army or at least uh, pay money uh, for army. And um, this, uh, we can see that it is very prominent part of the uh, civil communication of informal sources. Um, interesting thing that uh, as in most of the uh, online discussions, males are much more optimistic than female accounts. Uh, we use just uh, definition uh, from uh, social media as people report them. If they report themselves uh, males, we consider them males and uh, the same about females as it usually, uh, males are usually more interesting. Maybe these are gender stereotypes, but uh, they usually discuss more uh, techniques our interesting uh, new technique uh, that uh, uh, militaries received. Uh, also, they uh, are much more about uh, to discuss uh, like uh, geopolitics, geostrategy, and so on. And uh, uh, international support of Ukrainian army is uh, very important for them. And uh, for males, usually, uh, much more focused on uh, personal stories uh, and uh, particularly on stories about uh, uh, on sad stories about uh, death, about uh, um, war crimes and so on. Uh, we also see uh, how it was distributed uh, on different regions. Of course, East is uh, much more uh, focused on bad news because uh, it was uh, shelled uh, uh, much more. The West is much more optimistic because uh, it is uh, far from the front line. Uh, so uh, the largest share of good news is uh, on the West and uh, so on. And at last about emotions, let's focus on it. And we see that the most prominent was the emotion of pride. Uh, the second is anger. These first two emotions are highly mobilizing. Uh, they allow people keep themselves moving forward and uh, help the army. Uh, that is um, very helpful for uh, our uh, motivation to struggle. And uh, also a lot of laugh we can see almost seven percent of laugh uh ukrainians are very uh, humoristic nation they like to laugh uh, on, on their enemies uh we told a lot of stories of uh, poor uh, prepared russian army of uh, stupid russian uh, authorities and so on uh, it is uh, very impressive that 7% of all posts, uh, the, the most prominent emotion is love. So uh, at the end of the first month, we made the conclusions and showed it uh, to uh, our receivers that Ukrainian society in general remained highly motivated and mobilized during the war. Even bad news are more likely to uh, lead to anger than sadness. Russian propaganda has no success in Ukraine. Uh, its own messages are unpopular. Ukrainian government mostly controls the situation in the information space, but not the agenda. Uh, uh, Ukrainian government sometimes successfully communicates, but most of all people usually provide uh, determine which uh, news they uh, have to focus. Uh, Ukrainian society is fast in overcoming traumas, so when something bad happened, people usually uh, 
trying to overcome it, uh, work uh, internally uh, in their society, uh, discuss that, but um, usually in one, two, three days, uh, also um, good news became more prominent again and again. So it's a classical overcoming of traumas as it usually happens uh, in uh, Ukrainian, uh, in, in, in personal, um, personal uh, psychological state. Uh, the same thing is uh, usually in uh, uh, society Ukrainian, yeah. And uh, the overall em emotional trend is still deteriorating over time. Uh, and, um, but this uh, confusion uh, was just about uh, those period. Uh, let's uh, stop a bit more uh, about uh, how we process this data. It is only manually because we use a very, uh, very uh, complicated uh, analysis categories. Uh, some uh, people uh, tried uh, to help us, for example, the team of uh, scholars from the New York University, uh, and uh, they had no success. Uh, they tried to uh, feed um, machine learning process, uh, uh, just training uh, on our uh, on our uh, data sets and uh, tried to receive some results, but uh, the best result for one of the categories was 60% uh, of confidence. Uh, so it was uh, very bad. If somebody can have any ideas how to make this complicated process that works with Ukrainian and uh, Russian uh, language uh, became more automatized, uh, how to make it uh, faster, how to make it uh, more convenient and less um, manual work, uh, you may just uh, tell me and uh, um, we would be happy to discuss it with you. Thank you very much.